Right now it's like 12.30 a.m. I've been on the shift for five hours. We go from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Just because it hit uh, midnight, I'm going to go through a bunch of my to-dos. There's a lot of electrolytes I need to check. I need to check if people are urinating enough, so I gotta check their ins and outs to see how much fluid they've received and how much they've urinated. At some point, I'm probably gonna go to the ICU and just, uh, you know, walk around and make sure all the ICU patients are tucked in, the nurses don't need anything. I still have uh, two potential admits for today. I did one admit already, it was for a heart attack. The patient is doing okay and probably gonna need to get a cardiac cath at some point to see if they need any stents placed. This guy, I need to check his potassium levels and check if he has a CT scan done. A bunch more patients to go through. Uh, this guy has really low sodium level. Oh, this is the guy that I also placed those lines on um, earlier today and he got intubated. Looks like the sodium is not back yet. His ABG is back though and it looks a lot better after he got intubated. So that is good. And uh, now I got some floor patients to check on as well. Everybody's sodium is really low today. There's a lot of people in the hospital with heart failure right now and uh, flu, flu is like really big right now. Uh, let's see, midnight eye and O check for this place patient with heart failure. Usually they update the eyes and O's around midnight. They're only negative 90 cc's. It's weird, they have not been peeing very much at all. Um, so I'm supposed to give Bumex, which is a water pill, and uh, give three milligrams instead of two milligrams. So I'm gonna put that order in now. Just double checking her blood pressure is okay. She's been running on the low side, like on the 90s, 100s. Um, and so usually, you know, in these patients with really end stage heart failure or just like really low EFs, they're always gonna have low blood pressures and yet we still have to diurese them. There's that whole thing about the Frank Starling curve where like, you know, they're volume overloaded. You actually diuresing them is gonna help their blood pressure. Um, but obviously people always get nervous, you know, if you're, di if you're gonna, order a huge Lasix or Bumex dose and somebody's blood pressure is like 90 over 50, you know. So I'll put in that Bumex order right now and uh, that'll be it for my uh, to -do, midnight to-dos. So I'm just reviewing some of the patients a little bit more here and one of the things that I really like actually about uh, being on nights and admitting people is uh, I get to kind of follow what their hospital course is uh, from the day team and I like just like seeing what results they have and like what changes in the plan people have. I've never been a huge fan of doing those kind of like lifestyle vlog videos. I know they're super popular. For me, I just feel awkward, you know, going around, taking a camera in the hospital. Definitely not my comfort zone, but you know, on Kaiser Nights, I'm literally here alone. Uh, there's nobody to talk to. There's nobody to, you know, judge me if I'm like recording myself right now. So I kind of feel like I do want to make like a little mini <laughs> day in the life right now. So there is one person that I really like, uh, their medical vlog videos and it's a person named Violin MD like she just makes such wholesome videos and they're so well choreographed um, the way she designs them and the way she like is a great storyteller about the patients she's seeing uh, and she just does it in a very tactful manner too like there's never any concerns for like patient privacy or anything uh, I highly recommend checking out her videos uh, very cool day in the life videos if you're interested in that kind of thing all right now I think I'm gonna head up to the ICU and just lay eyes on all the patients make sure they're doing okay and uh, at that point, I could probably just start working on some Anki cards or, you know, my heart failure, like what I want to talk about in my heart failure lecture. One thing I want to talk about is that uh, when you're on nights and when you're in the hospital, uh, you have to stay hydrated for sure. I'm already feeling pretty dry right now. The extent of what I'm drinking, uh, you know, I probably shouldn't be drinking all this stuff, but there's a Diet Coke, a Diet Pepsi. And I got this like water bottle that's like a, just freaking like an ice block. I've been trying to <laughs> sip on this, but uh, yeah, sometimes you gotta figure out where the uh, the water is and you gotta make sure you stay hydrated in the hospital. So let's uh, go up to the ICU and see how the patients are doing up there. Oh my God, I just walked in the conference room and there's so much free food still. This food is actually really good. There's apples, some more Diet Cokes. I gotta restock, I gotta put all these in the fridge before they go bad, but there's still chicken. I already had two of these. I don't know if I should eat a third. Like some like Japanese curry thing. It doesn't look that great, but like, man, it actually tastes really good. All right, let's stock up a little bit here. All those there, and then, uh, ooh, gotta open this up. Oh, shit. <laughs> gotta open these. And uh, add some more of these Cokes in here. I have a whole bunch in my pocket. And uh, gotta take away some of this old stuff, too. These things have been here, I don't know for how long. I'll try to throw these out. And uh, let's add in these guys back in. Let's go. Oh. Oh. Nice, I saved them all. 
This one I dropped on the hospital floor, so I think this one's a lost cause. Bye. All right, peeps, I'm back from my ICU rounds. Pretty short, pretty sweet. Kind of walking around, just eyeballing the patients, trying to see if the nurses need me. It's nice to establish what the patient looks like at baseline and if the nursing um, staff has had any issues. And mainly I'm just going around, kind of letting the nurses know that I am, I'm like available and I'm there in case they need anything. Like I'm not really doing anything. I'm not making any changes to the plan. I'm not like offering any like profound changes to the plan. I'm, I'm literally just like walking around and just like asking for updates. But it's also very useful because, you know, if the nurses need any orders right then and there and at that moment, then you can just do it then and we want to get paged later. It's just I really love ICU medicine and you know, I like procedures. I like a lot of aspects of it, but um, it just really is sad seeing all these patients in the ICU because um, a lot of them just have like really bad prognosis. It's very sad. But yeah, hopefully, uh, hopefully everybody stays uh, good overnight. I'm really eyeing this uh, this chicken thing again. I think I'm gonna go for it. Oh man, this is gonna be the third one I've had today. I didn't even work out today, but I worked out the other two days. Maybe that's why I'm so hungry. So let's freaking go for it. It doesn't look that appetizing, but trust me, when you mix this, it's like freaking good. Mmm. Pretty good. All right guys, it's 2 a.m. I just did a couple more to-dos. Uh, nothing else has happened since then. I, I ate that dinner. I'm really bad at DDR compared to Pump It Up, the Korean DDR version, uh, so I need to get better at that. Now I should probably do some Anki maybe and uh, maybe update some of my dot phrases for Kaiser um, for when I'm on boards or on days next week. I can still take an admin until 4 a.m., so still just waiting for a potential admin at any time. Uh, but tonight's been pretty, pretty okay so far, so uh, just waiting to see what comes in. I'll do some Anki and maybe some other productive stuff at this point. Um, maybe walk around a little bit to get these three uh, rice bowls out of me. So I guess I only have like 16 cards to do and I had like 20 cards and I did a couple. So tuberculin skin test is positive at what diameter in healthcare workers? Should be 10 millimeters. Uh, you know, five millimeters is HIV, close contacts, 10 millimeters is us with slightly higher risk and 15 millimeters in normal individuals. What happens to urine osmolality in intrinsic renal AKI? Uh, urine osmolality should uh, it should drop because um, your kidneys are not able to hold on to anything anymore and just like dumps a bunch of fluid, so it decreases. Damaged kidneys, unable to conserve water. Not easy. Um, tuberculin skin test, I believe demonstrates good mediated response to Lepperman skin test, whatever, uh, not very high yield anymore. Eye related complication of congenital CMV is cataracts? Chorioretinitis, not congenital cataracts, uh oh. Uh, it's not really useful for me anymore. Fistulas can't be used for, for continuous HD because the device used for access, they use like this needle, so you can't leave a needle in for like super long time and you know, people are gonna move their arms around at some point, so. Um, contralateral hemianopsia, sensory loss, pain, and hyperalgesia due to thalamic involvement. God, I don't really remember these that well. Um, I, I don't know, some kind of thalamic stroke syndrome, I don't know. PCA syndrome, F it, I don't know. Contralateral hemianopsia, sensory loss. Yeah, I don't know. It's, how long should heparin drip? 48 to 72 hours, uh, yeah. What is the max blood flow rate through dialysis through catheter? Was fistula catheter can go up to like three, 300, 350. And fistula can go more, like 450 milliliters an hour. Yeah, 350 versus 450. All right. Why do patients with nephrotic syndrome get periorbital edema? It's because uh, they don't want, they're not like heart failure patients where heart failure patients don't tend to lie down because of orthopnea. 
Uh, these patients can lie down, so when they lie down, they get periorbital edema. Uh, how does calcium affect the QT interval? Hypercalcemia will shorten it, and hypocalcemia will, long, will prolong it. Yeah. Prostate-specific antigen and uh, something are used to detect prostate cancer, digital rectal exam, uh, whatever, 7.4 years. <laughs> uh, Interleukin-inducible enzyme expressed in inflammation but undetectable in normal tissue. I don't really know whether this is like a step one question. Cox 2. Hell yeah, I'm so good. Like, what the hell? I don't even remember what this even means anymore. I still get it. Describe the acid-base disturbances that may be seen in a patient with asthma. Uh, yo, uh, they can have respiratory alkalosis, and then um, uh, initially respiratory alkalosis, and then it becomes a respiratory acidosis once they start, you know, retaining. Um, with the spleen, central arterioles are surrounded by lymphatic something, yeah. Enzyme, and that was four-year interval there. Enzyme which prevents cortisol from acting on the mineralocorticoid receptor, that's 11-beta HSD. Um, if you take black licorice, this can overwhelm the 11 beta HSD and you can cause hypokalemia and hypernatremia um, because you get overactivity of the cortisol and mineralocorticoid receptor. Where is the substantia nigra? Freaking heck if I know. I'm pretty B. See, I just, some, some things I just like know, even though I don't actually even know what this even means anymore. But oh, and that's it. All right, we're done with that. Let's make some more cards. Uh, so I want to make one. Um, I'm going to be typing with one hand. Can J point elevation be suggestive of acute pericarditis? And the answer is yes. This is something that I learned yesterday. Um, so let's make a quick card on this. our chief resident sent out some uh, morning report learning uh, thing. So I'm going to find uh, a few things that I want to add on to as um, potential Anki cards. So orbital cellulitis, I don't think there's that much that I need to add here. I might add some stuff about this non-inflammatory versus inflammatory uh, arthritis or gout. Yeah, I might add uh, some of this, uh, you know, 10 is greater than 30%. Uh, sur body surface area. I think I might not have uh, known that exact number. So uh, let's make some uh, let's make some cards off of these as well. What is the preferred bisphosphonate for hypercalcemia malignancy? Is zoledronic acid. Uh, this was based on the uh, learning points that they added. And usually I'll like verify things to figure out like you know why. So I guess there was um, this study that low zoledronic acid is the most potent that, um, agent compared to you know the other ones. So uh, yeah, sometimes I like to verify it, and then I will add that as a card. There's another one I want to add. Is it uncommon for first-time gout flares to be polyarticular? And the answer is yes. And, uh, you know, this is something that I didn't totally know, you know, that it's more common that over time they start uh, becoming polyarticular. So, you know, a pretty basic one, but this was another learning point from their morning reports. This is a pretty basic one, but uh, I actually didn't really, I, I think this is a good review for me for inflammatory and non-inflammatory arthritis. I needed to do a quick review of that. Uh, but what is the difference between white blood cells between inflammatory and non-inflammatory arthritis? Uh, inflammatory is going to have 200 to 50,000 white blood cells, non-inflammatory less than 200. And then I added a bunch of other helpful tips. Um, so the white count can also, or the polymorphonuclear cells can also make a difference. Inflammatory arthritis, think gout, RA, or septic arthritis. Non-inflammatory, think osteoarthritis. And then gout usually is less than 50K, WBCs, but septic is often 50K. And I had to do like a little bit of quick review to like go over, you know, inflammatory versus non-inflammatory. So you can see that uh, arthritis can broadly be classified into two categories, inflammatory and non-inflammatory. And you can see that the inflammatory ones are septic, crystalline, or autoimmune. So uh, that's a nice little review. And like I mentioned, uh, we'll just do a quick card on TENS, toxic epid epidermal necrolytic syndrome. Uh, involved involvement of greater than 30% of body surface area. And uh, that's it. I think that's those are the main cards I need to add. It looks like we got our second admission, so uh, I'm going to start reviewing this patient's chart. It looks like they're coming in for possible coffee ground emesis and syncope, and they have a history of like a gastric bypass. So um, we'll have to see. Are they like bleeding somewhere, and that's why they're syncopizing? We'll have to see. So uh, let me take a look through their stuff, and uh, we'll go see the patient. All 
All right, I just got back from seeing the patient. Very nice lady. Um, she came in with basically kind of coffee ground emesis over the last day or so, and uh, was very hypotensive when she came in. Blood pressure like 60 over 30. Um, they gave her three liters of fluids and she's feeling so much better, but she was like, man, I thought I was gonna die. Like she felt so bad. Um, but now she's doing a lot better. I think she definitely has got some kind of bleeding peptic ulcer. She has a history of this bypass and a history of uh, peptic ulcers and um, may have been triggered by a, a couple of drinks and some smoking, which she doesn't normally do. At this point, I think she's pretty stable and um, we're just gonna continue, you know, a PPI and anti antacid therapy. I think the big thing that we had to do is uh, talk to GI and figure out if they wanna scope her and potentially intervene on any bleeding vessel if there is something there. Also, she was never able to get an H. pylori test uh, from her previous hospital stays, so I think it would be nice if we could get like a biopsy to see if she has H. pylori that's causing these recurrent ulcers. So yeah, let's get to work on putting the admission orders in. All right, you guys, it is 4.55 p.m. or sorry, 4.55 a.m. and uh, I finished uh, writing the whole note for the patient, putting in their orders, and uh, staffing with the attending. Uh, the patient's hemoglobin actually just came back. Uh, I mean, first of all, right now she's feeling much better, but uh, her hemoglobin just came back. It went down from 9 down to 6.5, so actually quite a significant amount of bleed. Uh, so we are going to give her a transfusion now. Um, I also just kind of laid eyes, um, well, I just chart reviewed all the other patients, made sure all the to-dos were done, and uh, looks like everybody seems to be doing okay. So uh, other than transfusing this new patient, I think uh, all the tasks are done for today. So I'm going to head to the call room and try and take a, a little bit of a nap. Um, you know, obviously a couple pages are probably gonna come in, so I'll be waking up intermittently. But now will be a good time to try and get uh, like an hour, an hour and a half of sleep uh, before the day shift comes in. So uh, not too bad of a night overall. Here we are in the call room. Uh, nice to take off all those pagers. And uh, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to sleep. I don't really feel that tired today. Um, but uh, we will try and we will see what happens. Have a good night, you guys. All right, you guys, it's 6.55. Uh, day team is gonna be coming in in five minutes. So I'm gonna go sign out to them. I didn't sleep that much because um, I mainly, I wasn't that sleepy, so I ended up watching some YouTube videos and then I probably did sleep like 30 minutes, um, but uh, not too much sleep, which is unfortunate, but it's okay, I'll sleep at home later. Uh, so time to go sign up to the day team now. All right, so overall, pretty chill night. It's definitely nice when we have a night like that because sometimes things can get really, really busy. But overall, I mean, I still feel like I did quite a lot of things on that shift. You know, I placed some lines, I did a few admits, and I did some more productive stuff on the side as well while covering for all the floor and ICU patients. Hope you enjoyed watching that video. I'll see you in the next one and peace.